This is Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University. I'm Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College of Business and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Success Stories is a program that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. One such person is our Attorney General, Steve Marshall, who is my guest today. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, you actually have something in common with my grandfather. You wouldn't have known this, but he was born in Atmore, Alabama. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Atmore boy. Go yeah, back, uh, he, was, a long time. he was born in 1929 during the Depression and was delivered for free. So I'm sure, yours, I'm sure your <laughs> delivery actually cost some money. But uh, I want to jump ahead to, um, to law school, improbably. That's where, that's yeah. where we're going to start and talk about your time as a law student and whether you could have foreseen becoming attorney general of our state at that time. Yeah, clearly no uh, about being AG and partly because I don't know that while I was in school there was really this long-term plan. You know, it was, law school was exciting for me and, and frankly loved it far more than I really thought. I didn't grow up, you know, knowing lawyers. I didn't come from a family that had lawyers that were connected to the family that, you know, I'm from Atmore and I've been a rural guy my whole life, although we've lived all over the South. And the thing I knew about lawyers is they seemed to be people that kind of made differences in community. And that was a little bit of the attractive feature for me, but didn't walk into law school, you know, someone, you know, you've had Judge Pryor on here and you know, he was very thoughtful and deliberate about what he wanted to do and how it was he wanted to approach the career. Transparently, I was probably the opposite. I really much more allowed the career to come to me. Um, you know, I would have never told you that, you know, when I finished my, my law school career that I would ultimately be a prosecutor trying cases for a long time and definitely never thought there was some opportunity for me down the road to become attorney general. But um, there's no doubt God's had his hand in the direction that I've gone with my life. You know, doors have opened in ways that I probably never imagined. Um, but in, in a weird way, I've had the most eclectic law practice going from big firm to trying murderers and rapists to eventually becoming AG. Uh, and not only am I now working at what I think is the most fascinating law firm in the, in, the, in the state, but get to do things that I would have never, ever considered in my career. Well, I was going to actually ask you about your time in private practice because I think most people associate you with the office you hold now or with your uh, position as district attorney. You were a district attorney for what, 16 years? Yeah, Something a little like bit that. over that. Uh, but people probably forget, many people, that you were in private practice before you became district attorney. What type of cases did you work with when you were in private practice? Yeah, when I first came out, it was uh, at, a, at a large firm in Birmingham, the old Maynard Cooper firm, which is now Maynard Nixon. Uh, really great people I had a chance to work with there, um, but it was large securities cases. That was kind of my, my niche for the first couple of years that I was there. And uniquely, you know, now we live in a world where law firms are regional, now they're international. Well, back then they were basically usually housed in one city. And one of the unique opportunities I was ever given and never had an idea of how it would transpire was had been at the firm for a couple years, and Bo Torbert, who used to be Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, uh, was coming off the bench. I think he had a, a brief run for governor that he backed out of and, and came a part of the firm. And I was a single guy with no real connections to Birmingham, and they said, would you be willing uh, to go to Montgomery and work for Judge Torbert? And not only was it two years that uh, were just a remarkable experience. Judge Torbert, other than my dad, probably had as much influence on my life, you know, to be able to work with him. But it also really taught me what it was like to be a professional and how it was I should conduct myself as a lawyer. And, you know, a true training ground. You know, I've laughed and told people that when I was here in Montgomery for a couple of years, I used to sit at the kids' table when Judge Torbert would be with all the other folks. And when I came back as AG, I got to sit at the adult table. A little bit of a different transition. but. Um, left judge after I've been down here for a few years in the firm for five years and went to Gunnersville and it was the biggest risk I've ever taken but also uh, everything that really has happened to me was as a result of that decision and had a small practice where I did everything from appointed criminal cases for a short period of time to uh, the run-of-the-mill cases that come in to small-town law firms and 
it was a great training ground to, to really sort of broaden the practice and know the different areas of law, but it probably connected me with why I became a lawyer in the first place, and that's to try to be a problem solver and, and help make people's lives a little bit better. Well, as we sit here today, we're just beyond Thanksgiving. We've got Christmas coming up. I like to think of this season as a reflective season, a contemplative season. And I'm wondering if there are people in your lives who had a special influence on you. You mentioned Judge Torbert earlier. Are there people like that who shaped the trajectory of your career or who inspired you in special ways? Yeah, I think Judge Torbert, from the standpoint of the practice of law, um, because he was such a gentleman, number one, and uh, I really, when I became the Attorney General of Alabama and I received the appointment, first call I made was from my, my late wife to share with her. The second was to Judge Torbert's wife, because I felt like he would be proud to know that I was in this position, and, and in some ways, uh, my own father had passed, Judge Torbert had passed, um, the, the very people that, that I really would want to have shared that news with um, were, were no longer there. And, and so it was kind of special for me to talk to Ms. Torbert and, and just kind of be in that moment because I knew how much uh, he, had, he had influenced my life and really shaped where I was as, as a young lawyer. And then you know, beyond that, frankly, many of the greatest influences I've had in my life was, was from coaches. Um, you know, if, if you could throw a ball, hit a ball, bounce a ball, that was what I did growing up. My dad worked in sporting goods. I was never the best athlete, but I always had the best gear. You know, I mean, it was like that was the calling card for me. But, um, but it really being a part of a team, being in that unit, but the coaches uh, were profoundly influential on me sort of as I grew up. And then, you know, I can look back and I can tell you a couple of teachers that um, I was a shy kid, I'm still frankly pretty shy, um, that really sort of came to me and said, you know, you have an opportunity to do things in your life. Um, and, and really gave me the confidence to be able to do some things that maybe otherwise I wouldn't be willing to do. Um, you know, I think about Ms. Royal, Ms. Commissar, Mr. Graham, people like that, that, that had a chance at, at an early age to be able to shape me and then I've been very fortunate to have uh, some wonderful faith leaders in my life uh, that have shaped the ability to, um, for me to understand not only sort of my own personal faith, but also particularly as a public figure, the ability to allow my, sh my faith to be able to shape uh, the decisions and the work that, that we do. Well, I'm glad you brought up your faith because I was going to ask you about that, if you would mind talking about it. I know right now you're a member of Church of the Highlands, but you've, you've also done mission trips abroad. And I know that faith is central to your identity. It's something that you don't just leave at church on Sunday. You carry it with you to the office every day. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to just talk about your faith a little bit. You know, look, I'm a passionate believer in Jesus Christ, and that really is kind of central to the core of who I am. You know, people talk about, um, you know, sort of me in the context of a title, but I don't view myself from the standpoint of what I do, it's what I believe, and that's, that's in my own faith in Christ. And so there's no doubt that, you know, when, when inevitably those difficult times come, and look, anybody that's going to be in the political light, you're going to have those difficult periods, and in some ways those can be professional. Like me, they can also be a very difficult personal time that occurred in a very public way. You know, it's, it's those times that, that I've been able to rely upon my faith and, and I think in a very profound way. But the other is my faith gives me accountability. And I'll never forget, you know, really the reason I got to Highlands here was when I came to Montgomery, you know, my family was still in uh, Marshall County and knew that I was gonna be down here in a new place and a new role. And one of the first calls I made was to Chris Irwin, who's become a dear friend, who's the, 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 the campus pastor at Church of the Highlands to say, look, I need an accountability partner. And it was a very random call to a guy that now is very special in my life, but it was a little bit of this recognition that be grounded in your faith, have someone that's willing to hold you accountable to that is really that guiding star about the direction that you need to go. Um, and uniquely, it was the same when I was a prosecutor is where I am now. You know, I've given the remarkable privilege every day to come to work and do the right thing. I mean, that's kind of, 
neat job description to be able to have, and my faith helps guide what those decisions was, are, are like. And so I'm a remarkably blessed man. When I think about this period of time, you know, there is clear reflection for me about all that I've been given, but within that context, though, is what am I giving back? And that's always a reminder as well. Well, you are sort of the last link in a chain going back to several attorney generals who are very prominent, who have done a lot for our state. Uh, names like Jeff Sessions, Bill Pryor, you mentioned Bill Pryor earlier, Luther Strange. The Office of Attorney General is such an important position. And I'm wondering what your view of the role of, of the Attorney General is. If you could say a little bit about um, what it means to, to serve that, in that function. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a remarkable privilege, number one, because you're given the opportunity to be the voice for so many. And, and frankly, when I walked into the job, um, I really sort of probably viewed it in a much more narrow lens than I do now, that it was kind of that super prosecutor, if you will. You know, everybody talks about the chief law enforcement officer, and it's very much the role that the, the AG plays, you know, and, it, and it's probably where I was very much, you know, felt comfortable. The work I'd done as a prosecutor, the work I'd done on behalf of victims, the, the experience as being a local district attorney, I think equip me for that and, and, and much of what we do in the office is in the criminal justice sphere, but it is clearly not the only thing. And one thing that I don't know that I completely understood when I walked in is the breadth and scope of the things that you have an opportunity to be engaged in. You know, I would have never thought, you know, Greg Abbott told a funny story about when he was AG in Texas and they asked him, you know, what's a day like for the AG? And he said, I come to work, I see the federal government, and I go home, right? I mean, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but yet there is that role and, and, and is centered around the concept of federalism, the idea of the 10th Amendment about what is the ability to allow a state to exercise its sovereignty when confronted with the use of federal power. And frankly, it's the most fascinating thing that I do it is probably the most interesting because it raises very unique issues of law that come about. Um, and, it, and it's much more than just simply what we deal with in Alabama, but also what we deal with as a nation. And in some ways, I think you've seen this both with Republican AGs and Democratic AGs, is this idea of the function of the Attorney General being a check on federal power. Now, some of that depends on who's the party in power and what's going on. But also, if you think back to COVID, for example, attorneys general across the country were pivotal pieces in what our national response and state response was to the pandemic and how far could we go in uh, infringing on individual liberty. And those are profoundly you know, important questions. And, and why as AG, it's really unique that you have an opportunity to be able to weigh in on those fights because you know, it's one that I think our founders would appreciate. You know, when you look at the discussion even within the Federalist Papers about kind of the direction and where we were going as a country, that was a much debate. And we're still having that debate today. But it's now centered in a way that I think people understand that, that AGs are uniquely given the privilege of being able to weigh in on those and we allow the courts to be able to consider those decisions. Yeah, it is so interesting that matters of federalism remain unsettled. The interplay of the states and the federal government, the size and scope of the federal government, the relationship of states to other states and states to the federal government, these matters are always with us and we're always working through them as a country and the role of an attorney general is so important to the debates that revolve around uh, federalism. There's a particular issue that is contentious in today's culture, and that's the uh, transgender right. transgender issue. And you're working on um, um, some some matters involving that. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, you know, uniquely, um, one of the things that you see is around the country, AGs kind of develop some unique expertise that then other states take advantage of. You know, whether it be you know issues around coal, West Virginia, for example, Kentucky have worked a lot on energy. Louisiana worked a lot on energy issues. One of the things that we've done is really dive into this issue of gender affirming care, as it's referred to, and what's going on with children who um, want to potentially transition uh, their gender. And 
you know, uniquely um, Alabama passed a law a few years ago that's been challenged and we're fighting that case uh, here in district court. Um, we have the Department of Justice that's weighed in, but it's not a unique problem or issue to Alabama. You see uh, other states, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, others that have weighed in and, and the, the kind of back to what we we're talking about earlier, it's the state's role to be able to protect kids and we see that historically. The question is how far can a state go? And the argument from the other side is it should be a parental decision. We see, you know, medical providers argue about standard of care and what that means. Uh, we think very clearly that this is a failed experiment that Europe has rejected that we do not see a consensus in the medical community about and that we think the state has a clear right to be able to weigh in uh, and to be able to protect kids in this way. And remember talking about during the age of minority, not during the age of majority. And, and really proud of the fact that we've developed expertise that we've used around the country to be able to share about, number one, what we think is the facts underlying this. And we think there's a great deal of misinformation by the medical community about what this means. But also, um, we've been able to try to relate it. What's the right way for the courts to analyze this issue? What's the, the level? And we get in the weeds when we talk about levels of scrutiny, right? And this, you know, we believe it's a rational basis analysis that the courts ought to engage in. Um, but also trying to get judges to embrace, as we saw with Judge Sutton, who you've seen speak before, right? And He's been very on the show. Very wonderful opinion. Very first guest um, on the show. And, and he came out with what we believe is really the, the framework that courts ought to approach this issue. You know, it's, it's ultimately, and it gets back a little bit to Dobbs, you know, this idea that health-related decisions are typically the domain of the state. It's what we argue during the vaccine side. It's what we see with the abortion decision that came out that the courts, Supreme Court ultimately said it's up for the state legislature to decide. We think this is uniquely one of those similar issues. And what we saw Judge Sutton is, is come out and say, you know, I'm not here to weigh in on whether it's right or wrong. We can debate whether or not you know, WPATH and the, the international organization is right in the way they establish standard of care or whether or not, in fact, it's more of an advocacy organization, which we argue. But also, he just sort of said, here's the role and the function of the courts in this analysis. And we ultimately think there's an interest of the state in being able to regulate in this area. And, and I think we've seen that methodology ultimately adopted by our own 11th Circuit, uh, by one of my former Solicitor Generals, Andrew Brasher, on that case. Uh, and, and they wrote a very thoughtful opinion, and Judge Burke will be able to decide that for Alabama going into the next year. But uh, look, it's a critically important case for me just because I've invested a lot of personal time uh, into this particular question and diving in and understanding not only the history, but also really where the science is right now. Um, and, and this is one of two cases where we've seen the federal government decide to intervene and weigh in uh, in our state, and, and, and I think it's important that we have a chance to really use the form of litigation to show why we believe that, that the Alabama legislature acted irresponsibly when they decided to do this, and why, why we think the, the arguments by the other side are, are, are legally and factually wrong. Well, you rattled off a list of uh, states earlier, and I know you're involved in RAGA, Republican Attorney General's Association, and have been, I think you've even uh, yeah, just up. left it. Yeah, just left his chair. How do attorneys general coordinate with each other? How do they work together on cases? You mean how do you herd cats, right? <laughs> I mean, that, no. Uh, you know, we. One of the things that, and you asked earlier about the the role of AG. The thing that that has been really inspiring for me is the quality and character of people that we can get to come work with us because uniquely they can't do this work anywhere else. It's why. You know, my chief counsel, Catherine Robertson, who's amazingly talented, could be making lots more money other places. But because of the work we do, I can attract somebody like her. Eddie LaCour, who you know is now my solicitor general. Eddie, you know, he went to law schools that didn't consider my application, right? I mean, it's just we're able to get Eddie and a team of lawyers around him uh, and convince young lawyers to come into our constitutional defense side as well because of uniquely the work that we're doing. And so, you know, there is within that, Solicitor General side, and it's one reason why um, Judge Pryor was so influential at a national level during his time as AG, because 
the role of the Solicitor General really would not percolated within the, the, the bodies of offices across the country. And he really launched that through what we've done in, in Alabama. Now that's become the norm across the country. And so you know, we talk with one another, both my colleagues as well as from the senior staff and Solicitor General side. And uh, one of the things that, that we know is that we're able to identify issues when they emerge, but also take advantage again, where uh, we have the ability to initiate litigation that, that impacts things at a national level or develop expertise that others can use at a state level, that we have the ability to leverage that. Because there's no doubt that uh, it takes an enormous amount of work to shepherd one of these cases to fruition uh, and we need to be uh, you know, aligned on, on that effort to be able to make a difference. It doesn't mean that, you know, that there's, there's this really sort of structured framework that we're using. It's probably, I would refer to it more as kind of a loose coalition, um, but yet uh, it's something that we've seen work well. And the other thing that I can tell you is you can probably tell by the letters in which we are writing, the, the comment letters we submit in agency rulemaking, kind of the coalition of AGs that kind of care about certain issues or are aligned maybe more so than others. And, and you can see you know, the fact that you know, Steve Marshall and Jeff Landry, for example, are gonna be together almost all of the time on issues because we tend to come at it from the same perspective. Well, this is a business school program. So I'm going to ask a business related question. I know you're probably not expecting that, but people, associate the Office of Attorney General with um, a constitutional officer, with being the state's prosecutor, being the state's lead attorney, but the function is also managerial in the sense that you have a very big office with many different employees and you have to manage that workforce. You have to uh, oversee many different departments. What is it like as a manager? I mean, that's not something you and I went to law school. That's not something right. we learned in law school. It's something that now that I'm in a business school, I think about more regularly than I would have before and as an administrator. But I never had training in that. I never studied for that type of role. And I'm sure that it was probably the same for you. You, you, you had some experience as, as district attorney, obviously, overseeing an office and staff. But what is it like as a manager of, of people? Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful challenge because, you know, it's more than simply managing a law firm, if you will, um, because we have sworn law enforcement within our work. Um, we have consumer specialists that, that have a very almost like better business bureau function. And then we obviously have a majority of lawyers, I think roughly 70 plus, that have both criminal and civil responsibility. Um, so it's, it's a unique uh, challenges as far as what our mission is and what we do and I think one of the things for me that we worked very hard on early on is coalescing around what's our mission and what's our role and how do you take all of those responsibilities and kind of funnel that into a common purpose and and we really talked about serving the people of Alabama because that's ultimately what we do whatever the function that we have in the office our mission is to serve the people that ultimately put me there and one thing that I think is also a little bit of a challenge as a manager is when a normal company hires a CEO, you know, while there may be a contract, there's no term typically given. Well, when an AG comes in, folks know they're only there for four years guaranteed, right? And so there is this sense of how do people embrace you as a leader knowing that from the first day you walk in, they know the day that potentially you're walking out the door. And, and for me, it's been a little bit of uh, an evolving process, but the one core thing that has never changed is the fact that you treat people fairly, you create expectations, you give them the tools to meet those expectations, and then you try to find accountability. But the one story that I told the office on the very first day I was there was that I wanna work with people who are willing to take out the trash. And what I meant by that is that we're not defined by our job description, that we see ourselves part of a broader mission. And that means if you're walking down the hallway and you see a thing of trash on the ground, don't wait for the person who's there to clean up the office at the end of the day to do it. Do it yourself because it's what you ought to do. And so I want people ultimately that are bought into the mission of the organization and just simply say, 
I want to do whatever it takes us to be successful. And I can tell you that um, I've been blessed right now to have a team around me that I think are just amazing people. Um, and then they then are given the challenge and the responsibility to do the, everything they can to be able to cultivate the people that work under their leadership. I think um, we're still working and evolving to try to make our place better. Um, Want to engage in even more professional development, both um, almost at, at, a, at a macro level um, uh, for the office as a whole, but then individually with lawyers and in, in the work that they're doing. It's why, you know, uniquely all of the debate around um, working remotely was a little bit troubling for me, particularly when you're working with lawyers, because the young lawyers that we have in, I think one of the ways that they learn how they grow, how they mature as lawyers is being around other lawyers. And a little of the worry of if we just had people working at the house, would they have that interaction, whether it be at the water cooler, around the break room, just in going down the hall to be able to see somebody else, would they be able to grow? And um, look really proud of, of, of our office and our team um, and just thankful for the fact that I'm given this window of opportunity to be able to work with them. But my name's not on the door because I don't own that office. I've been given the opportunity to be there. Uh, and I tell them all the time that, that I, I still have this vision of when my last day is and it's going to be incredibly sad because I'm not going to be able to work with them anymore. Well, your humility and tenacity are to be admired. And thank you very much for coming on the show and Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas to you. Thank you very much. This has been Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business. I'm Alan Mendenhall. Until next time. Mm -hmm.